The title of this talk is Nosocomial Amplification of Pandemics, Understanding Healthcare for System Fragility. My name is Eric Lofgren. I'm an assistant professor at the Paul G. Allen School for Global Animal Health. And the first thing I'd like to do is acknowledge some of the people who have sort of guided and helped me along this pathway. Uh, Nina Pfefferman, who has indulged in my fondness for simulation and empirical data for a very long time. My clinical collaborators, Dev Anderson and Rebecca Mooring at Duke and David Weber at UNC, who was the chair of my committee and is really responsible for my interest in healthcare epidemiology in the first place. And then much of this work came about and was refined while I was a postdoc under Stephen Eubank during both the MERS and Ebola epidemics, where I worked with Maya Majumder and Caitlin Rivers fairly intensively, Sarah Rea at RTI International, who I'm currently working on this with, and last but not least, the hardworking graduate students of the Lofgren Lab, Matt Meachin, Caitlin Jackson, and Stephanie Johnson, who are pictured on this slide. So the first thing I'd like to do is sort of define the problem of nosocomial amplification. And that is an emergent epidemic making the jump from the community to the healthcare system, and how that's often associated with a rapid acceleration of the epidemic itself, a sharp increase in the number of cases, and sort of the beginning of some of the sort of system level breakdowns that we see occur during emerging pandemics. This is often heralded by failures in infection control, either errors in uh, contact precautions, not recognizing that there's an infection that requires them, things like that, and or constrained supplies that cause sort of cascading system failures. And one of the sort of pernicious problems here is that infections among healthcare workers cause further strain in the middle of a spike in demand for healthcare workers. So you get this sort of negative feedback loop. And essentially what this is, is an interaction between the community, which generally speaking has a lower basic reproductive number, lower selective pressure when we're talking about bacterial diseases and lower severity of infections because of sort of the baseline level of health in the community as compared to a hospital where generally speaking, the hospitalized population has much, much higher levels of comorbidities. There's much higher selective pressure and there's often but not always a much higher reproductive number associated with um, nosocomial transmission. So I think really the iconic and sort of uh, really template case for this is SARS, which was particularly hard on healthcare workers. So 43% of all cases in Canada ended up being in healthcare workers. This figure is 41% in Singapore, 57% in Vietnam. And there's an outbreak in a hospital in Toronto that I think is really emblematic of sort of this problem and how it's illustrated. So if you look at the epi curve on this slide, early in the epidemic, we have sort of single cases in this index family as cases start to arise. One of them is admitted to the hospital and shortly thereafter, there's a very sharp spike in cases. Many of those are in hospital staff, other patients or visitors to the hospital. And many of those take place before infection control realizes that contact precautions need to be established to bring the outbreak under control. And you can see sort of an example of how this um, occurs based on the attack rate in different hospital units and then how much time was spent not under, in this case, contact or droplet precautions. So within the ER, there was an estimated attack rate for this epidemic of 13.6 cases per 1,000 nursing hours. And that's largely because there were six 12-hour shifts uh, within the ER where there was no contact or droplet precautions in place. If you contrast that with the ICU, that had a much lower attack rate of 2.4 cases per 1,000 nursing hours. And that's because there was only a three-hour gap between when um, nurses and healthcare workers within the ICU could have been exposed to one of these patients and when they recognized the droplet precautions needed to be put in place. In contrast, in a coronary care unit, there was a similarly high attack rate of 31.3 cases per thousand nursing hours. And that was again, because there was at least eight of these 12 hour, of these 12 hour shifts before you had the chance to put in contact precautions and sort of take the appropriate infection control measures. The second example in another coronavirus is MERS or MERS-CoV. And in an analysis that we did of a little over a thousand publicly available cases of MERS, excluding cases in South Korea, uh, we found that 15% of those patients were healthcare workers. 7.4% of the severe cases were healthcare workers. In this particular case, being a healthcare worker was protective against death and severe disease, but that's still a fairly substantial sort of burden on the healthcare population. And then when we look at the South Korean outbreak, which is why we excluded it in the original analysis, that outbreak is fueled almost entirely by nosocomial transmission and failures in infection control. And that's really brilliantly illustrated by this transmission network diagram uh, by Maya Majumder and some colleagues of her, where any of these cases that arise in these green sort of fans are cases that took place in healthcare settings. So you have the initial sort of index case and then a 
hospital acquired um, outbreak in that hospital. And then it propagates to a number of other hospitals. And the outbreak is almost entirely fueled by patient transfers, hospital shopping, failures in infection control. And generally speaking, this is essentially an entire epidemic that's, that's almost completely nosocomial. And one of the really interesting things is that for nosocomial transmission of MERS, in sort of all the settings that were looked at, there's a very high reproductive number. So a fairly recent analysis estimated that the r naught for the Korean outbreaks was 3.9 in the first cluster. So St. Mary's Hospital was 4.04. .04, and in the largest cluster, it was uh, closer to five. And then also this um, study estimated the basic reproductive number for the outbreaks in uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and estimated that in Jeddah it was 3.9, in Riyadh it was 1.9. This is very similar to an analysis we did in 2014 uh, for the South, uh, sorry, not the South Korean cases, the Saudi Arabian cases, where we found that an estimated reproductive number of somewhere between 3.5 and 6.7 for Jeddah and 2 and 2.8 for Riyadh. And generally speaking, this contrasts with a non-hospital r naught for MERS that's either below or close to one. And so this is really where we see a lot of the amplification as cases reach the hospital, there's a failure in infection control. You get sudden and very rapid transmission in clusters, which um, put healthcare systems under strain. You infect visitors, other patients, and it propagates back into the community. So probably the other best example of this is the West African Ebola outbreak and Ebola in particular. So this outbreak had a very severe impact on healthcare workers, just in terms of sort of the severity and the risk to healthcare workers versus members of the community. The World Health Organization has estimated that healthcare workers were somewhere between 21 and 32 times more likely to be infected than members of the public. And this killed 513 healthcare workers during the outbreak and another 813 fell sick. This would be a, a, a pretty appalling number anywhere, but it's disastrous in a region like West Africa where you have 1.5, 2.2, and 3.7 healthcare workers per 10,000 uh, people for Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia, respectively. These are countries that cannot take massive shocks to their healthcare infrastructure, but Ebola did deliver one of these massive shocks. This resulted in an 8% decrease in healthcare workers in Liberia and a 23% decrease in health uh, services in Sierra Leone. And we can see the knock-on effects of that. There's some 4,000 more cases of sort of maternal death due to lack of availability of resources. There was um, threats to the measles uh, elimination programs in these countries simply because there were no vaccination workers. These are very severe infrastructure level problems that hit this country, uh, these countries particularly hard. And this idea of nosocomial amplification in Ebola has taken place sort of since uh, Ebola was first recognized. The first outbreak in Sudan in 1976 um, really happened when a symptomatic case was transferred from a, a remote area to a district hospital. And then within four weeks, one third of the hospital staff were infected and 41 had died. And this district hospital also helped propagate these cases into the community. We saw very similar dynamics in 1976 in Zaire. And then also in the Democratic Republic of the Congo in 1995 and Uganda in 2000, you see a very heavy dominance of hospital transmission disseminating to other hospitals and to the community. And for Ebola, there's sort of this much tighter sort of link between hospital infection control failures and community transmission because of the role of transmission at funerals. So even in the hospitalized cases, you have ample opportunities to transmit to uh, members of the community due to funereal practices in these regions. So we did some, some modeling work during the West African Ebola outbreak, looking at sort of the, the interaction between the availability of care and improved care and community level control. So in October of um, that outbreak, there was a plan to deploy what are called Ebola treatment units. And these are essentially mobile pop-up, very um, specialized hospital systems designed to treat Ebola that have decent infection control, isolated rooms, things like that. And at the same time, there were reports that some of the campaigns to reduce community transmission, promote safe burial practices, things like that were starting to take place. And so what we ended up modeling for this is we, we fit the model to uh, the data we had at the time, and then we projected out, okay, what if just the community reductions that we're seeing in sort of um, transmission are taking place? What if we just sort of turn the dial on hospital capacity? And what if we do both? What do we see? And the answer we came to from that model is that in neither case is either just a full increase in um, 
the availability of hospital beds, that's not enough. And a decrease in community transmission wasn't enough to sort of push things down to often exponential growth curve. But if you combine those two things, so if essentially people start treat, seeking care, start looking to go to hospitals, and the hospitals are both there for them and equipped to treat them, that we saw a, a much reduced uh, epidemic and one that actually largely matched the trajectory of the epidemic that we then saw. So another follow-up question from that was this question of sort of more beds or better beds. So is this simply a capacity problem where we need to just sort of shove hospital beds into the region, or is there a role for improved infection control? And if we compare increasing ETU bed availability versus improving infection control um, as expressed by sort of a percent reduction in transmission once you reach the hospital, we looked at the US government's plan for Liberia, which was 1,700 ETU beds in 10 weeks. And then we considered a scenario that was half of that and then a scenario that was double that. And then we compared that with a, um, a sort of question about, okay, once you get to one of these hospitals, how well can we control, control your epidemic? How likely are you going to transmit to healthcare workers and patients? And we looked at one where it's 100% reduction. So once you're at the ETU, you're not going to give it to anybody else a 90% and an 80% reduction once admitted to the ETU. And then correspondingly lower figures for the other sorts of treatment that were available for Ebola, which is Ebola community centers, which is essentially community hospitals attempting to treat Ebola, and then home care kits for when capacity was truly full and we could provide some sort of basic infection control precautions for people taking care of their relatives at home. So sheeting, um, latex gloves, face masks, things like that to try to reduce transmission. And what we see if we look at this um, figure on the left, which is admittedly a little bit complicated, is in any sort of cluster of these three, which are the um, rollout, so the, the planned double the number of beds and half the number of beds, there's a much bigger impact if you hop between those clusters. So that's improving infection control as you go um, down this way versus increasing hospital beds. So really what we saw is illustrating this is that if you had to choose between, can we deliver twice as many beds to an area? And can we make sure those beds are well-equipped and um, well-supplied and well-trained in terms of their healthcare workers to improve infection control, that that second option is, is likely to result in a much, much better outcome for the health of the population. And the problem with that is that question of supply. So this is a, a spreadsheet that was from the Ministry of Health in Liberia in August of 2014 during the um, epidemic. And one of the things we can see is that the supply constraints for PPE are extremely low. At, sorry, the constraints are extremely high. The levels are extremely low. So there are zero face masks in the country and it's estimated they're going to need 213,000 of them. They're almost out of gloves. They're out of hoods. They're out of backpack sprayers to essentially hose down things with um, disinfectant. They're out of goggles. They're out of hand sprayers. They've got five heavy duty plastic napkins, uh, aprons in the entire country, 54 pairs of rubber boots when they think they're gonna need 1200. And so we can see all of these things where we're starting to see very severe supply constraints. And so the question is not just, do we have beds that we can put people in, but can we clean those beds? Can we protect the people treating the people in those beds? And the answer by and large was possibly not. And even where it's not constrained, for example, uh, where they have still close to 1,200, uh, 12,000 surgical masks in the country, they are forecasting for uh, three months needing 213,000. So even when it feels like there might be enough, there's still very high projections of those needs down the road. And the question is, is this purely a developing world problem? And I think the answer is COVID-19 has made it abundantly clear that PPE and supply constraints are not a problem confined to developing world hospitals. I was part of a recent survey of 69 hospitals in what's known as the Shea Research Network, which is the Society for Healthcare Epidemiology of America, asking hospitals about their policies as the COVID-19 epidemic was taking shape. 40% of these hospitals reported their supply of respirators being somewhere between limited and crisis level, while only 15% rated their supply as sustainable for the pandemic. This was very similar to how they rated their supply for protective gowns. 68% of hospitals were using respirators for extended periods. So for example, you get a respirator and you get to wear it for the entire day rather than changing it between patients or changing it every couple hours. And this was 71% for the more constrained hospitals. 48% were trying to figure out how to reprocess respirators. So to um, heat treat them or chemically treat them or something to essentially put them back in circulation. 
And this impacted hospitals, not just hospitals that were experiencing severe outbreaks, but sort of all hospitals as they were trying to prepare for this. So these practices were positively but not significantly associated with the test positivity rates of where the hospitals were. And in these hospitals, there was also a lot of concern about sort of hospital community interaction. And you can see this in a number of ways. One is the variety of um, policies regarding the type and number of visitors for patients. So some hospitals uh, just prohibited all patients. Some had very special circumstances for end of life. For example, there was often one person could visit. Very rarely could just everybody visit. For birthing partners, there was often sort of one person restricted while someone was giving birth. Similarly, for pediatric patients, there were exceptions where, you know, one parent could be with a pediatric patient. But generally speaking, visiting was extremely constrained in most hospitals. And then 36% of facilities in this survey provided on-site or local accommodation during the pandemic. Most of these primarily for workers in COVID-19, ICU, or emergency department units. So essentially trying to help their um, healthcare workers both avoid bringing disease back to their communities, their families, their households, but also um, candidly trying to keep the community level spread away from their healthcare workers and keep their healthcare workers up and running during uh, very high demand uh, periods. So looking at nosocomial COVID-19, which has sort of been masked by the broader spread of, of COVID-19, early outbreaks in China um, suggested that about 44% of cases there were nosocomial, um, primarily in medical staff rather than patients. There was a large outbreak in Durban, South Africa, involving um, six clusters in five hospital wards that was then disseminated to a nursing home and a dialysis unit. This infected 80 staff members and 39 patients and ultimately resulted in 15 fatalities. There has been some estimates of sort of the increased risk of a COVID-19 positive, uh, COVID positive test among healthcare workers compared to the community. And we see, again, a very high sort of increased risk, in this case, a, a hazard ratio of 11.61 uh, for healthcare workers as compared to the community. And one thing that's really highlighted in COVID-19, especially because of the vulnerability to the elderly, is the intensive interaction between hospitals and long-term care facilities. And that essentially, if we think of long-term care facilities as sort of another node on that conceptual diagram, that long-term care facilities and hospitals are essentially continually reseeding each other and causing sort of uh, continued outbreaks in, in both settings. So this is some data that was analyzed from um, NHS England showing the total number of hospital acquired cases. You can see it, it rises steadily in November uh, and then continues to head up in December following the, the epidemiology of COVID-19, unfortunately. And you can see the percentage of total cases that are nosocomial, which is the orange line, start to rise and reach almost a quarter of cases. So this is still a very significant problem, even in a disease that we are largely thinking of sort of community level um, transmission as, as being very influential. Now, because this is such a sustained and intense um, pandemic and sort of widely disseminated um, both globally and within the United States, there are some sort of complexities to this question. So how many healthcare workers are acquiring infections from the community versus the healthcare setting? Um, and then within the healthcare says, setting, are they getting it from patients while they're, they're caring for patients, performing aerosol generating procedures, things like that? Or are they getting their exposures from other healthcare workers when they're in break rooms and are unmasked and things like that? So there was a uh, outbreak at Bay State Health that eventually concluded that based on their review, there was a group of cases that was the result of travel to a, a hotspot somewhere in the US. So someone acquired a case from the community, carried it back to the hospital, and then staff were convening in a break room and removed their, their masks, uh, violating sort of the universal uh, masking policy that, that was in place in that hospital and uh, not observing proper social distancing. So here you have sort of nosocomial transmission that's, that's part of the workplace more than is a direct result of sort of healthcare uh, as, as a profession. So the one thing I wanna illustrate this is that while these seem like exceptional problems, there are a lot of parallels to sort of everyday run of the mill hospital epidemiology. So one thing is that most healthcare association, uh, associated infections are emerging. So some recent examples are Clostridium difficile or Clostroides difficile, depending on who you are that we've seen a large rise in cases in the sort of early 2000s uh, that then uh, have, have thankfully flattened out and started to go back down. But this was uh, sort of an emerging infectious disease. And the one that 
healthcare epidemiologists were all concerned about uh, prior to COVID-19 and, and was the focus of a lot of our attention was um, infections like Candida auris, which emerged in 2004 and has slowly spread across the globe and has started to cause major hospital outbreaks in both acute care hospitals and especially um, long-term uh, skilled nursing facilities. So this is again, a, a drug resistant infection where there's, there's very high levels of transmission within hospitals. And so dealing with emerging infectious diseases is not an unfamiliar problem for uh, hospital epidemiologists. Another illustration of this is, is what I call slow amplification of community methicillin resistant Staph aureus. So conventionally, we think of MRSA as being classified into community acquired and hospital acquired MRSA. And these are different strains that have different resistance patterns and sort of never the two shall meet. And that generally speaking, um, the community acquired MRSA is more susceptible to sort of our frontline antibiotics. However, there's been the emergence of a strain USA 300 in the United States, which is theoretically a community MRSA strain that has fueled a third wave of infection of MRSA and is now a common source of healthcare associated MRSA. And there's some studies that have started to ask if hospitals and the communities they reside within are really epidemiologically distinct. Hospitals are commonly both, they have large catchment areas for the population, but they're commonly the largest employer in a region. So are you exposed to the hospitals? Often um, a much, much more frequent exposure than we normally think of it for many, many communities. So this is again, looking at this, um, the picture on the left is the proportion of clinical infections in a particular set of hospitals associated with USA 300 versus USA 100, which is the sort of prototypical hospital acquired strain. And you can see that in, in many of these cases, it's 50-50. It's so USA 300 is, is well represented within hospital systems. And then similarly, some uh, data out of Finland suggested that essentially they, one of their um, strain types was predominant in both hospital associated and community associated groups, as well as in healthcare outbreaks and family clusters, and was only not seen as the dominant strain in immigrant groups, which understandably have, have less interaction sort of temporally with the, the community in the hospital as new arrivals, and then uh, livestock associated livestock associated MRSA similarly had, had very different types to it, which again suggests that sort of the idea of viewing MRSA as there's hospital MRSA and there's community MRSA is, is a sort of flawed notion. There actually is this sort of cyclical um, amplification between the two. Now where pandemic diseases differ, especially in the way we model them, is that the base model used in a lot of hospital epidemiology is an adaptation of the Ross McDonald model, where you have the staff are either contaminated or uncontaminated, which means they've got essentially microbes on them, uh, be it their, their hands, their clothing, things like that. And healthcare workers are often assumed to be essentially just transient carriers of disease. So mobile fomites, they're essentially a pair of hands with stuff on it that goes from patient to patients. This works really well for most um, hospital acquired infections. So um, C. diff will live harmlessly in someone's guts unless their flora isn't, uh, as long as their flora isn't disrupted. So about 10% of us carry um, this particular pathogen in our intestinal tract all the time. And as long as we aren't exposed to certain things that disrupt our intestinal flora, we're fine. It doesn't cause disease. Similarly, um, there've been studies of MRSA colonizations where you sort of take skin swabs of healthcare workers and the ones that come up positive for MRSA, they've often cleared that by the next day. So essentially they, they go home, they shower, they're not exposed as intensively to the hospital microbial environment and their infection goes away well, their colonization goes away. So now I wanna talk about moving forward and how to synthesize some of these ideas together to start thinking about how to actually tackle this. And one is to start viewing emerging infections as both a nosocomial and an occupational hazard. So in contrast to the models we just talked about with conventional healthcare associated infections where you don't worry about the risk to healthcare workers, for emerging infectious diseases, clearly we do which means we have to model many, many more complicated um, behavior patterns. You can't ignore things like the contacts that take place during staff meetings or at a nursing station or things like that, that we often ignore when we're studying healthcare associated infections. And so now you have this sort of occupational hazard and healthcare associated infection question. And in a policy sense, this introduces some interesting questions about equipoise for patient versus provider safety. How much risk can we expect a healthcare worker to accept in order to effectively treat patients. And you can imagine both extremes of this where essentially we expect healthcare workers to assume infinite risk in order to treat their patients. 
And that's sort of not a thing we can ask of people. And at the same time, we can imagine the other extreme where the answer is we're not going to risk healthcare workers. So when you're admitted to a COVID-19 ward, we um, hook you up to a ventilator, we shut the door, and that's the last time you ever see a healthcare provider. That's clearly not medically ethical. And so what we have to find is the sort of space in between those two where we can balance these hazards and try to address them. Methodologically, this becomes a very complex optimization space and one that's potentially experiencing dynamic constraints. So for example, what does this look like when you have plentiful gowns and gloves and face masks versus the question when these are much more reduced? Uh, a further question as we look at this is how does this impact things like other inf uh, infectious diseases within uh, the hospital? When we're trying to control MRSA and we're trying to control COVID at the same time, how do those things interact with each other and our decisions we're making about COVID increasing your likelihood of getting other infections? And one of the questions that comes up here is one that's a perennial debate within healthcare epidemiology generally, which is the idea of whether we should be target, targeting horizontal versus vertical interventions. So horizontal interventions are ones that impact all pathogens along one particular point on the sort of causal pathway to infection. The canonical example of this is hand hygiene. Many, many pathogens um, end up being on your hands. And the idea of how do we prevent them from getting from your hands to the next patient is you wash your hands. That's the classic horizontal pathway. Contact precautions generally are a um, horizontal intervention, things like that. Vertical interventions in contrast are a collection of interventions that target a single pathogen along multiple points in the causal pathway. So this is anything where you're looking at intensive screening for particular um, pathogens, um, chemical sort of decolonization of people, for things like MRSA, anything involving engineering the, the microbiome. So that can be introducing sort of commensal staph species to the noses of patients or fecal transplant for the prevention of C. diff. These are all vertical interventions. They're targeting a specific pathogen. And I'd argue that this parallels the preparedness debates around things like, should we intensively surveil for spillover? Should we be sampling populations of bats to try to identify what is the next pathogen? Should we be doing forecasting versus talking about the logistical aspects of pandemics? And essentially the, the argument is that no pandemic is made worse by having an excess of PPE. And so that's something that even while we do sort of the more vertical searches for emerging infectious diseases, that we can put those things in place and have those supplies prepared and those will have benefits both for sort of any pathogen that comes down um, the pipe, as well as the sort of day in and day out um, infectious diseases that we deal with in both the developed and the developing world. The other thing to look at, and one thing that um, my lab is particularly interested in looking at, is sort of the population structures that emerge in a hospital as the result of human behavior. So if we take an ecological view of hospitals, they're very weird metapopulations. Essentially, they're highly segmented groups of individuals where then people hop between them. And some of these are deliberate population structures. So you can think about specialized wards as clearly um, sort of deliberately created um, pockets of particular populations, be they pediatric populations, oncology populations, the burn unit, things like that. We can think about patient cohorting, which is things like COVID-19 wards, where we try to put all patients with a particular pathogen together because they've already experienced um, this infection, so they can't get it from um, being in the same hospital as someone who has it, things like that. And those are deliberate ones. But we're also seeing that there are emergent population structures that come out of things like the hospital built environment. So where are rooms positioned and does that create natural pathways that nurses and doctors use when they check on patients? Are there duty rosters and scheduling and policies about cross coverage that encourage things like continuity of care, which means a single nurse may see you many, many days so that they can sort of develop a feeling for what is your normal for your vital signs and things like that. Those create essentially metapopulation structures within an intensive care unit. So some modeling work we've done on this is essentially looking at an ICU as a metapopulation. So here we have a ICU where we have a single intensivist and six nurses, and each nurse is assigned to three patients specifically. So those are their patients. But one of the things we started asking is, okay, but that's not really realistic. Often you might need two nurses to help with a code or something like that. There will be cross coverage while people take breaks. And so what we did is we sort of allow that parameter to vary. And we see here, the parameter in question is, is gamma in this model. And that varies anywhere from um, 
one over six, which is essentially the same as if this was random mixing and all nurses could treat all patients all the way down to one, which is strictly like you see your three patients and those are the only patients you see. And what we see is as you get more strict, the number of acquisitions, acquisitions of, in this case, it's, it's MRSA, start to go down. And so one of the questions is, and then go down in sort of a nonlinear fashion. And so one of the questions is, can we start looking at adapting these population structures as we see pandemics emerging? So for hospitals, we, we asked um, my, my clinical collaborators, where do you think you are on this spectrum? So how often is a nurse sort of strictly seeing only their own patients? And for UNC, they estimated it was probably about 80%. And for Duke, they said, ah, oh, it's probably about 90%. Um, we don't know the accuracy of those numbers. I was starting to work on some projects to do that, but that involves direct observation in hospitals. And this was a project we started talking about in fall of 2019. So that's been put on hold for a bit. But then there's other questions about that. What about rural hospitals that are often typified by having much, much more constrained staffing levels? What about hospitals in low and middle income countries where you can imagine they're far more likely to be on sort of the left-hand side of this graph where nurses are sort of spread far and wide as they try to deal with very crowded wards? And can we start in, um, implementing staffing changes preemptively in the face of a pandemic? So rather than waiting until we have cases that are arising in a hospital and that we're seeing them and we go, okay, we need to put contact precautions in place and we need to put droplet and precautions in place. Can we start talking about some sort of proactive interventions that we say, okay, for the duration of this pandemic, we're going to try to adopt a more resilient structure for how we schedule things. And that will have consequences for staffing, that will have consequences for patient care, but that may be worth it to sort of help cushion the blow of an emerging infection. Um, we've also looked at this for other systems. So um, carceral amplification is looking at this in jails versus the community, which is where you have another sort of setting where you have a population with a very high reproductive number that interacts very heavily with the community where um, cases are arising. And what we see from that is that essentially the more people you have in jail and the less you control that epidemic, the more cases you also see in your community and among the, the staff of the jail. And so essentially that these two systems are intrinsically linked and by controlling um, infections in sort of the, the higher risk but smaller population, you can have pretty um, outsized impacts on community level transmission. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, if you're interested in talking about this more, I'm readily available online. My email address is eric.lofgren at wsu.edu. I'm often on Twitter at, at germs and numbers. And I would like to acknowledge the funding for these projects from the Center of Disease Control and Prevention. Um, I was part of the Modeling Infectious Diseases in Healthcare program, and they've also funded some work on COVID-19 modeling in hospitals, and then also the National Science Foundation for a rapid looking at this um, particular question. Thank you very much.